a little early for a review session for a Friday exam, but I tend not to like to do review sessions the night before because I think they don't give people enough time to think about the stuff. And I'm busy um, uh, Wednesday night, so I figured that this was the only night to do it then. So I'm actually busy Thursday night too, so Thursday night didn't work out anyway. But I tend not to review sessions the night before. So um, what I'm going to do uh, tonight uh, is uh, I know that the overview video that many of you liked cut out at the starting at the point of the um, um, epidermal growth factor. So I'm going to start um, and just go basically go back over that stuff here uh, to start this review session. I'll go through uh, the things uh, that were there. Uh, so the last review session, I, I cut it right here uh, because metabolic energy I really hadn't had a chance to talk about. So what I'll do is I will go from the point of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, epidural growth factor was up here. Where was it? Da, 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 da. Okay. I guess it was up above that. Okay. So it was actually above there. So here we go. So I'll start here, move down, and then I actually will go through uh, the things for the um, uh, metabolic energy as well. And then after that, if you have questions, which you may well, or you're welcome to ask questions as I'm going through things, then um, I'll be happy to take those. Is that OK? OK, I have good news. And the good news is I thought that the video from Monday's lecture was lost. I went back to my office, and I pulled it up. And I see that it looks like it took six seconds of this 50 minutes of video. And I was rather sick at that. And I told a few of you, I think, that in fact, there is no video of the Monday lecture. Well, I'm working with a new camera, and this new camera is absolutely idiotic in how it organizes things. And so even though it only showed six seconds on the camera, when I pulled the, um, the material off of the um, little video chip, uh, I discovered that in fact, there was a full 50 minute lecture on there. This camera is a pain in the you know what. But anyway. Um, so that's rendering right now. It should be uh, live on the page as soon as the, the uh, YouTube finishes handling that. So that video is complete and is there. So that's good news. All right. So um, what I want to do is go through uh, where the video cut off. And as I said, I'm going to start. Why does it keep going down there? I'm going to start um, with the epidermal growth factor receptor. OK. So. Um, the uh, receptors that I've talked about um, are important because the receptors that are in the membrane of cells are necessary for getting that information into the cells. And so um, uh, prior to the epidermal growth factor, I talked about the insulin receptor and its role of getting that information into cells. And ultimately, what that insulin growth receptor was doing was basically moving the GLUT4 receptor from the cytoplasm out to the membrane of the cell so it could bring in glucose. So anything or any signal that can't cross the membrane by itself needs a receptor to work through. So I said the steroids, for example, can make it across the membrane on their own, um, and they don't need an external receptor. But all the other hormones do, the non-steroid hormones do. So uh, epidermal growth factor is one of these. And uh, epidermal growth factor, like the insulin receptor, is also a receptor tyrosine kinase, an RTK. And epidermal growth factor dimerizes on binding to epidermal growth factor. I'm sorry, epidermal growth factor receptor dimerizes on binding epidermal growth factor. Okay? And that um, dimerization of that receptor causes the tails of the receptor to phosphorylate each other on tyrosines, like we've seen before. And that phosphorylation on the tyrosines is necessary for the assembly of a signaling complex, like we've seen before. Okay? So that signaling complex, um, I didn't ask you to memorize what was on it, uh, with the exception of the protein RAS. Now, somebody asked me a question earlier uh, about RAS and uh, what they've been told in other classes and so forth about how RAS works and how other proteins affect it. And yes, other proteins do affect RAS, and they do affect the GTPase activity that I've talked about. All I'm expecting you to know is RAS. Okay? So I'm not worried about GAP or other proteins that you may have learned elsewhere. So I think you've got enough proteins to learn, and we'll, we'll keep it simple. So for our purposes, we're looking at RAS as playing a very important role in that signaling process, that decision of cells to divide or not divide. So we see RAS as active when it's bound to GTP. 
And RAS gets activated when that signaling complex okay, itself is assembled. So it's the assembly of the signaling complex on the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, that's epidermal, ep I'm sorry, the epidermal growth factor receptor. So the dimerization, the phosphorylation of the epidermal growth factor receptor allows the signaling complex to be built. The signaling complex helps the RAS to let go of GDP and replace it with GTP, and that activates RAS. That activation of RAS is necessary um, for the cell to get that signal to divide. And as long as RAS is bound to GTP, it will be giving that signal to the cell to divide. And as we, we will see later, that poses problems. Okay? It also is important because obviously cells do need to get signals to divide as well. Yes, sir? Uh, is, it, is, is RAS married to a G protein? So RAS is very much like the alpha subunit of a G protein in terms of its activation. That's correct. Yeah. OK. So, um, so it be behaves like that. It behaves like a GTPase. There are other proteins that can help that activity to occur. We won't worry about those. We'll just treat it as if it's RAS. And um, as I said, it stimulates the replication. And there are effects on mutation. And I'll talk about that when I get down to the section on signaling uh, gone wild. So that was, in a nutshell, what's happening with the epidermal growth factor receptor. Now, later, when I talk about signaling gone wild, I will talk about a relatively minor um, epidermal growth factor receptor called HER2 that also is important in uh, the process of cancer. It's a cancer that's very common uh, in breast cancer, for example, among other types of cancer that can develop. And I'll talk about that uh, down below. OK. So um, after I finished talking about the epidermal growth factor, I talked about steroid hormone signaling. And steroid hormone signaling, uh, you recall, of course, is uh, something that does not require a um, cell membrane receptor because the steroid hormone can move into the cell on its own. And it does that. Uh, so the steroid hormone enters the cell. Uh, the effects of steroid hormone signaling are multiple. Uh, they include effects on metabolism, inflammation, the immune system, salt balance, sex characteristics, et cetera. And no, that's not a list I'm expecting you to memorize. But you should know that obviously steroid hormones are involved in a lot of processes um, important for cells. The steps in the activation uh, or the ac action and activation of steroid hormones is that they first are released in the blood. They can be released by a variety uh, of organs. And they um, move through the bloodstream to target tissues. And they move across the membrane, a lipid bilayer of those cells, uh, quite readily. It's not completely understood how that movement actually occurs. Uh, but we do know what it occurs. And for the most part, does not require any kind of an external receptor. Yes? I mentioned briefly that vitamin D is a sort of an exception to that because it's known that vitamin D um, do, does in some cases bind to a receptor and can be affected by that. And it's just more, mostly an anecdotal note that I've, I've made to say that. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how does it cross the membrane? It's not completely understood, but since it is um, a lipid compound and the internal part of the lipid bilayer is itself uh, a nonpolar compound, it's probably facilitated by that. OK, uh, let's see. So across the lipid bilayer, on the inside of the cell, that can happen either in the uh, cytoplasm, which is where it occurs most frequently, or in some cases, all the way inside the nucleus, where the steroid hormone finds its receptor and binds to it. OK, and so I don't give you any rules about which one's where or any of that sort of thing. But suffice it to say that the steroid hormone finds its receptor, it binds to it, and causes a change in the steroid hormone. That change in the steroid hormone is, again, like the many other changes we've seen, a slight change in structure of that protein. I talked about how um, some steroid hormones are bound to heat shock proteins. And you see those heat shock proteins bound to a steroid hormone receptor, keeping it in the cytoplasm. Binding of the steroid hormone to the steroid hormone receptor can cause a, ch a shape change that let makes it let go of the heat shock protein. And when the heat shock protein is gone, now that receptor bound to the hormone can go into the, the uh, nucleus and act as a transcription factor. 
meaning that it will affect the transcription of specific genes. Yes, ma'am. Heat shock protein, HSP. Okay. What's the point of the heat shock protein in that overall scheme? Okay. You'll notice that when that process starts, that the heat shock protein is bound to the steroid hormone receptor. Okay. What it's doing is it's covering up a part of the receptor that would cause the receptor to go to the nucleus. So it's keeping it from going to the nucleus. I told, I've talked a little bit in class about how various proteins and cells have targets, uh, have license plates that tell them where they're targeted. We'll actually talk about that a little bit more next term. But suffice it to say that there are amino acid sequences within a protein that will tell it where it's supposed to be. So one of those sequences that's available tells this protein that I'm, I'm supposed to be in the nucleus. And so there are uh, 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 factors in the cell that will facilitate the movement of that protein to the nucleus. Well, if you've got a protein like heat shock protein covering up those sequences, then they never get seen and it stays in the cytoplasm. Okay? So that's the function of the heat shock protein. It's preventing the receptor protein from going to the nucleus. So it works all very well. The steroid hormone binds to the receptor. The receptor sh changes shape. It loses the heat shock protein. And now those sequences are open and the, and the cell says, oh, look, this thing's supposed to go in the nucleus. And so it sends it to the nucleus. In the nucleus, of course, that's critical because that's where transcription of the genes will be controlled. And this heat shock protein controls that. So the heat shock protein will recognize and bind to specific sequences in the DNA and stimulate transcription of them. So let's imagine a simple example that there are proteins that are necessary for the cell to divide, for example. All right. In the absence of a transcription factor that tells the cell to make these genes, no transcription of those occurs, division doesn't occur. But now you've got this, uh, this um, uh, transcription factor that comes and binds to those sequence, and sequences. It tells the RNA polymerase, copy these sequences into RNA. Once they get made into RNA, they get made in, into uh, protein. Okay? And those proteins then will stimulate the process of cell division. So this sequence of events is important because if we stop something early, like we stop the heat shock, pro we stop the uh, um, transcription factor from making it into the nucleus, then no transcription will occur, and none of this other stuff will occur. But if it makes it in the nucleus, now we see the sequence of events occurring, which in this case would result in cell division. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, that's really what's happening, okay, with with steroid hormones. They're they're simpler signaling systems than we saw with the receptor tyrosine kinases, which usually go through a variety of proteins, a quite a wide variety of steps. And we're only seeing a couple of steps here with the steroid hormones. And that's one uh, big difference between the two. Okay. Other, yeah. Okay. Are all the other effects that are mediated by steroid hormones uh, the effect of transcription? For the most part, yes. So when we look at the signaling processes, I didn't really say this explicitly, but since you've asked the question, I'll tell you. When we look at signaling processes that happening, happen in cells, the way that these signaling processes exert their effects is primarily by two means. One is by changing the gene expression. That could be transcription and or translation. Okay, that is the things that, that are making the protein. And the other is by actually altering proteins that are already made. And we're going to see some good examples of that, especially when I start talking about glycogen metabolism at the end of the term. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, we've seen um, some examples of uh, all the examples that we have seen are, in fact, enzymes. Okay. But you could imagine that you might alter a protein so that it might not, for example, go to the nucleus anymore. All right. So it doesn't absolutely have to be enzymes. The examples that we will see will all be enzymes. OK? OK, good. Good questions. All right. Other signaling processes um, include, uh, of course, nerve transmission, which I said I'll talk about uh, next term. But I did briefly say in class that nerve transmission involved ion gradients that are built up outside of nerve cells. And the signaling involves opening up channels so that that ion gradient is altered in some way, and that provides literally an electrical signal. And that's why nerve signaling is so rapid 
is that there's literally an electrical signal that's being generated and it travels down the nerve cell so that nerve signaling can actually uh, uh, be, be transmitted in milliseconds as opposed to uh, waiting for the blood to go all the way through the body, something that might take seconds or minutes to do. So nerve signaling is, uh, of course, very, very rapid. And we'll get details of that next term. The other signaling method I talked about uh, was that of the prostanoids or the prostaglandins. Um, prostanoids is a broader category than prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are a subcategory of the prostanoids. Um, prostanoids are compounds. We'll, again, we'll talk about them uh, next um, uh, term. They're compounds that are made from fatty acids, and they are involved in quite a wide variety of processes. The only process uh, that I've talked about relative to uh, the, the um, uh, prostanoids are uh, pain and blood clotting. It's the two things that I've talked about mostly with them. So um, prostanoids cause fairly localized pain. The example I give in class was a bee sting. You get stung by a bee, and your um, cells in the area of that bee sting start producing prostaglandins like mad. Bee stings can be very intensely painful. They can cause a variety of other things, including inflammation and so forth, that happen uh, in association with that. The good thing about prostanoids is that they are fairly unstable. <coughs> oh, they're fairly unstable, and they don't travel very far beyond the place where they're made. So they're, they're so we, we call them sort of hormone-like. Okay? So hormones are made in one part of the body, travel to a very different part of the body, and exert their effects. Prostanoids are, uns are, are much less stable than that, and they don't travel very far. So that one uh, problem set question that I asked about that uh, related actually to that. Yes? Prostanoids are made at the point, very close to the point where they exert their effects. So a bee sting. That place of the bee, bee sting is where the prostanoids are being made. So specifically, the things that are being made are prostaglandins, a subset of the prostanoids. Now, the other effect of prostanoids that I talked about in class, as I said, are those related to blood clotting. And that's because a subset of the prostanoids, known as thromboxanes, okay, are produced from the other subset, which are called the prostaglandins. So we talked about how the thromboxanes are produced by platelets and they help in the area of a wound, and they help to make those platelets sticky. They stick to each other, and that helps to make that first initial plug to help try to close that wound up. So things that inhibit the synthesis of prostanoids will reduce the synthesis of thromboxanes, which will in turn reduce the likelihood of clotting. So that's why things like aspirin, which inhibits the synthesis of uh, prostaglandins, prostanoids, that is, okay, inhibits the synthesis of thromboxanes because thromboxanes come from prostaglandins. So aspirin is used to thin blood, and specifically it does delay the clotting of blood because the platelets are much less sticky uh, in the presence of aspirin than they are in the absence of aspirin. I'll slow down. Yes? Say it again, I'm sorry. So, well, pain has a function as well. Uh, so I don't want to say that pain doesn't have a function, but prostanoids have many, many uh, functions. And we're still learning a lot about prostanoids. Prostanoids are involved in inflammation, uh, which is important in the protection process. Prostanoids are involved in things like uterine contraction. Uh, they're involved in the process of childbirth. Um, they're involved in the replacement of intestinal tissue. They have a very wide variety of of functions. So there's many reasons that the body makes prostanoids. Yes? Yeah, so would the localized pain be important? Yeah, the localized pain uh, would help the body to know, hey, you got a problem on your arm, dude, right? So, I mean, that's why I say pain has a function. It's not like w we have pain for no reason at all. Yes? Well, we haven't, I haven't shown you the structure yet, but I've, but I've said that they're made from fatty acids. I don't want to get too far into them because we'll actually talk about them next term. And structure isn't important at this point. So um, they're made from, long, from uh, fatty acids that are 20 carbons long. Okay? But that's not important. If I tell you this, everybody's going to say, oh, we've got to write this down. right? So I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yes? Yes? 
No. Good question. Are, they, uh, are prostanoids created and stored for activation? They're, they're not. So uh, they, are, they are made, actually, from membrane fatty acids. And they're made immediately as they're needed. That's because they're unstable. So they're not stored, no. no. OK. So um, moving on past there, I went into signaling gone wild. So signaling gone wild, of course, was where I talked about problems with the signaling process. So signaling gone wild um, involves um, what we refer to as oncogenes. And remember that oncogenes are the mutated form of normal cellular genes called proto-oncogenes. And as the name would suggest, they named oncogenes before they named proto-oncogenes, because they discovered oncogenes before they discovered that they were actually cellular genes. Right? So I talked about how uh, chickens, uh, the first oncogene that was discovered was discovered in a chicken virus. And this chicken virus had this oncogene. And they didn't realize when they discovered it, but it, that oncogene came originally from a normal cellular gene of the chicken. That was, that was the SARC. Um, oncogene. And when they discovered that SARC actually had an unmutated form in the chicken, everybody was quite surprised, right? And that was very early in the scheme, right? Now we know quite clearly that mutation of those proto-oncogenes can lead to problems. But when they discovered it, they had no idea why was this gene causing cancer. And only when they later discovered this importance of signaling and so forth did they realize that that's why that was, was critical. OK, so I talked about, uh, what, four different uh, oncogenes there. RAS was the first one. And as I said, RAS, I kept it simple by noting that the inability of the GTP in RAS to get cleaved to GDP leads to uh, uncontrolled growth, or can lead to uncontrolled growth. Okay? So there are proteins and other factors that play a role in that process. The only one I've talked about, to keep it simple, is RAS. Okay? And for our purposes, that's how we're going to treat it. Mutations within RAS that affect the ability of the GTP to be cleaved result in RAS being left in the on state all the time, meaning it's bound to GTP, can't get it to GDP. Very critical for understanding that, right? A single base mutation at either amino acid 11 slash 12, depends on how we number the thing and how different uh, RASs are numbered or amino acid 61, and again, you don't need to know these numbers, all right? a single base mutation at those all right, can cause RAS to go from being a normal cellular signaling protein to being an oncogene. That is a scary thing, very scary thing. Yes? Is it a single base mutation No, either, either. Yep. That's making it even scarier, because two are much less likely, right? But either one will do that. Either one will result in RAS being an oncogene. OK, now I should also note that the process of getting a tumor okay, is a multi-step process. We look at RAS and say, oh, that one base change happens, and now you've got a tumor. It's more complicated than that because you have an immune system component. You have a variety of factors that have to contribute to that happening. But it has been shown in mice in some cases that you can actually target a specific uh, uh, RAS in mice and cause a tumor to happen. So you, you want to be careful with these things. That's why I say you want to be careful what you eat, drink, and breathe. It's very important. OK. Um, SARC was another uh, oncogene I talked about. SARC, as I said, was the first oncogene that was discovered. It was discovered in uh, chickens back in the early 1900s. Um, and SARC is also a tyrosine kinase, but it's not a receptor tyrosine kinase. That is, it's not found in the membrane, but it plays a role in the signaling process within a cell. Now, the thing about SARC is that SARC activates the um, uh, decision to divide, is what I will call it, the decision to divide when it is lacking phosphates on its tail. There's a tail of it that has several tyrosines. So when those tyrosines are not phosphorylated, the um, SARC will stimulate the cell to go through division. When those phosphates are phosphorylated, which is the case most of the time, then SARC will not stimulate that signaling process. So how does SARC become an oncogene? Well, the way it became an oncogene in the chicken virus 
was the chicken virus SARC lost those tyrosines. It couldn't be turned off because those phosphates were necessary to turn it off. And so when that SARC was being made by the virus, the chicken was, every chicken cell was getting this signal, divide, 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 divide. Really nasty, right? So anything that interferes with the phosphorylation of those tyrosines will convert SARC from a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. Yes? That's right. Phosphorylation turns off the signal for cell division. OK. Uh, let's see. HER2. HER2 is a relatively minor uh, receptor for epidermal growth factor. HER2 is another one of these exceptions. HER2 can dimerize without epidermal growth factor. It can dimerize without it. Now, you think, well, this thing's going to be on all the time, right? Because it's going to be finding each other. It's going to dimerize. It's going to send signals into the cell because it's going to autophosphorylate and all that. And if it, excuse me, if that happens, the cell will, in fact, go through division. The thing that keeps it from being, Gesundheit, the thing that keeps HER2 from being problematic is it's made in very low quantities. So it's relatively rare that two HER2s find each other. As long as it's made in low quantities, that's kind of a normal part of the cell, not a problem. The problem with HER2 is when the control sequences, that is the transcriptional control sequences, get altered so that instead of being made at a low level, it's made at a high level. Now, I gave this as an example because this is an example where a mutation has no effect on the structure of the protein. The structure of HER2 is not affected by the mutation I've just described to you. The mutation only affects the number of HER2s that are present in a membrane. So if you suffer this mutation so that now you're making more HER2s than normally, it's much more likely those HER2s are going to find each other and stimulate this process of division. And that's how HER2 becomes an oncogene. So HER2 is a good example of quantity, okay, as opposed to structure, being the problem. Yes, sir? How do you turn off HER2? Well, we have drugs that will turn off HER2. If we don't have drugs, you don't turn off HER2. You have cancer. Okay. If you want to turn off HER2, where, where, where you're making, for example, too much, there's a, uh, a treatment called Herceptin, H-E-R-C-E-P-T-I-N. And Herceptin is a, 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 what's called a monoclonal antibody. For our purposes, it's simply a, 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 an antibody that binds to HER2. And when it binds to HER2, it prevents HER2 from dimerizing. So if HER2 can't dimerize, it can't autophosphorylate, and it can't stimulate the cell to go and divide. That's how HER2 cancers are treated. And Herceptin is a very effective treatment for HER2. Yes? So anything is an oncogene when it is signaling the cell to divide uncontrollably. So it's signaling the cell to divide uncontrollably in the case of HER2 when you have too many HER2s. If you have too many HER2s, they find each other too often. So if you prevent them from finding each other, then you stop the effect, right? Question? It can only autophosphorylate when they find each other. So as long as it's relatively rare, that's not a problem. You got too many HER2s, you've got a problem. So yes, Megan. What are the factors that cause HER2 to be overexpressed? Mutation in the control sequences for its transcription. Okay, now, we haven't talked about transcription, so we'll talk about that next, next year. But basically, all cells or all genes in a cell are controlled by uh, sequences ahead of, uh, of them called promoters. So mutations in the promoters will change the amount of, of, of any given gene that's being made. So some of those will turn off a gene, meaning it's not going to be made at all. Others will activate a gene to be made a lot more of. Those are the ones with HER2 that will be problematic. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
So any one of those mutations can cause a cell to divide uncontrollably. I'm not sure what you mean by any one of those mutations. The ones I've described, yes. So I want to be, yeah, so thank you for asking that question. I want, I want to be careful. So what he said was, will any of these changes cause a cell to divide uncontrollably? Okay? There's a difference between having a cell divide uncontrollably and a tumor. So if I'm working in a laboratory and I take a single cell and I make these changes, yes, that's true. Okay? So if I make any of the changes I've talked about to any of these proteins, if I'm working with that in a laboratory, will it cause the cell to divide uncontrollably? The answer is yes. Does that mean that a person will get a tumor if they have any of those changes? And the answer is not necessarily, because as I said earlier, it takes multiple steps, multiple factors for that to happen. Your body has a protection, for example, against some of these things happening. That's why having a healthy immune system is important. Your immune system is protecting every single one of you right now against cells that would otherwise kill you. Everybody right now is making a cancer cell probably making thousands of them. Your immune system is protecting you. So in order for something to become a tumor, it has to escape the immune system. That's one thing. There are many steps. We know it's not a one-step process. There are many steps that have to happen in order for something to go from having a single change to becoming a tumor. OK? So remember that. So I don't want to have everybody panic that, oh my god, I'm going to die of cancer tonight, right? But it still means that the Less, the less we expose ourselves to these things, food, drink, air, right, that have problems, the less likely we're going to have mutations that will lead to this because it can be multiple mutations that make the problem worse. Right? Okay. What's that? As long as you don't breathe, you should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Last, uh, BCR able. Now, BCR and ABLE turn out both to be important in signaling. I haven't really said much about them. All I've said is that ABLE has a tyrosine kinase activity. ABLE has a tyrosine kinase activity. And I said that ABLE is made in cells at a relatively low level, relatively little. BCR also plays a role in the signaling process. And it's made at a higher level. Now, what happens with BCR able fusion is that you have crossover between two chromosomes, specifically chromosomes 9 and 22. And no, you don't need to know those numbers. Right? Crossover between those two creates a fusion between. The, and I, I would draw on the board, except for people told me they couldn't see on the board last time, so I, won't, I, I will describe it to you. It creates a fusion between the control sequences for BCR, which are attached to the amino end of BCR, which is attached to the carboxyl end of ABLE. Now, this arrangement inside of a cell will be transcribed because you've got the control sequences for BCR. You've got a new DNA that's been made as a result of this crossover. And this new DNA will be transcribed. And it's going to be transcribed at the level of BCR. And BCR is being made at a higher level. So you don't have BCR anymore. You have a new protein, BCR, fused to ABLE. The ABLE part that's there is the tyrosine kinase. And that's the part that's signaling the cell to divide. So when this fused protein starts being made, it gets being made at the higher levels corresponding to what BCR is made. But now it's got this tyrosine kinase activity that tells the cell, divide, divide, divide. We have the same problem that we had with the HER2. I'm, I'm sorry, the same problem that we had with, uh, yeah, with, with the HER2. Right? We got too much of it. But the advantage here is we've got a brand new protein. It's not BCR. It's not ABLE. It's a hybrid of the two. Unique proteins are perfect targets. It's like a bullseye. Okay. You ever see the Gary Larson cartoon with the deer? It's got the bullseye uh, thing on it. And it says, you know, bummer of a birthmark, Hal, because 
the bullseye is saying, shoot here, right? Well, that's what BCR has got, is it's got this bullseye. It's a unique protein. So if you can target something that hits BCR able fusion and doesn't affect other things so much, you got a perfect thing to knock out cancer cells without affecting normal cells. So it turns out that there is a compound called Gleevec that preferentially hits this protein. It does a pretty darn good job of hitting this protein and not affecting other proteins. Consequently, you have what people call a magic bullet. It's targeting cancer cells. And it's not perfect. I'll be honest with you. It's not perfect. But it's very, very good. Okay? This type of mutation is common in what's called chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML. This Gleevec is now used to treat it. It's very, very effective at doing so. OK. Questions about that? Yes? It doesn't form a covalent bond, no. It's, it's, a, it's an, a competitive inhibitor of it, but it's very effective. So Gleevec is not a, a suicide inhibitor. Other questions? OK, so that's the end of the signaling. And that's actually where I ended the other night. Now I'm going to say a few words about metabolic energy, even though I've just given that lecture. So now I've got a complete set of overview for you. And then um, I can do whatever you guys want me to do, a song and dance or whatever. You see how bad I sing? I dance even worse. So, OK. So metabolic energy, several things to consider. All right. Let's remember that we have some terminology here. All right. Catabolism versus anabolism. Catabolism breakdown. Anabolism synthesis. Catabolism provides metabolic energy, and that metabolic energy is stored as ATP. It's also stored where there's oxidation as NADH. Anabolism is where we're using metabolic energy to build things. So anabolism is where we're making, for example, carbohydrates. We're making fatty acids. We're making amino acids. We're making nucleotides. Those are all anabolic processes. And they require metabolic energy in the form of ATP, in some cases GTP, in some cases CTP, and in some cases UTP. But predominantly, they, they, they require ATP. They also use electrons from NADH. So this tells us that catabolism is generally energy releasing and oxidative in nature. Anabolism is largely energy requiring and electron or, and, and reducing in nature, I should say, reducing in nature. So we have to reduce things to make bigger molecules. I talked about Gibbs free energy. And with respect to Gibbs free energy, um, I noted the uh, Gibbs free energy equation, delta G equals delta G zero prime plus this thing over here. And I pointed out that the variables in the equation are delta G and the concentration of products and reactants. Delta G zero prime is a constant for a given reaction. And I drew the parallel to the henderson hasselbalch equation where we had pH, which is a variable, is equal to the pKa, which is a constant plus the log of salt over acid, where the as salt and acid were variables. Okay. So we can use the same sort of logic that we had for the um, um, henderson hasselbach that we can use here. Okay. The natural log is just like a log in the sense that if the value of products over reactants is greater than 1, the log is positive. If the value of products over reactants is less than 1, the log term is negative. Next, we need to remember what the values of delta G correspond to. The values of delta G, when delta G is negative, means that the reaction will go forward as written. When delta G is equal to 0, the reaction is at equilibrium. And when the delta G is positive, the reaction goes backwards as written. Now. I noted that people have the biggest confusion between these two values. Don't confuse the two. The value of the delta G0 prime people talk about as tendencies to do things. 
but they're only tendencies. And those are tendencies relating to starting with equal amounts of products and reactants, because delta G0 prime relates to standard conditions. So if I say that delta G0 prime for a reaction is negative, it means that at standard conditions, okay, starting it with, with equal amounts of products and reactants, if the delta G0 prime is negative, then that means that this term over here has got to be positive. And for this term to be positive, it means I've got to have more products than reactants, which means the reaction has gone from equal amounts to greater amounts of products. It's gone forwards. If the delta G0 prime is positive, and I start with equal amounts, at equilibrium, I will have more reactants than I will have products, which means it will have gone backwards. So those are only tendencies. In reality, we don't start with equal amounts. So the delta G, uh, the delta G predicts for all concentrations. Okay? For all concentrations. We can find the delta G for any concentration of products and reactants if we plug the values in and then look at what the sign of delta G is. That will tell us the actual direction of a reaction. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Can you say more on that? Do you have questions about that? Yes? That's correct. So delta G0 prime only indicates tendency when we have standard conditions. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. So KEQ is simply products over reactants for our purposes. Yeah. That's all it is. So you can just substitute what was said in class, KEQ is products over reactants at equilibrium. Yeah. Yes. So delta G equals delta G naught at standard conditions. Why is that? So he said delta G equals delta G naught at standard conditions. That's true because at standard conditions we have equal amounts of products and reactants, meaning we have a log of 1, and the log of 1 is 0. So therefore, delta G equals delta G 0 prime. OK? Everybody clear? Good. I want to see everybody get 100 on this on the exam. I was really bummed at the henderson hasselbach equation last time, folks. And so read the question. Please read the question. That's very, very important. What? You guys all have good heads on your shoulders. OK? And so don't fall into patterns of, this is the way I do it. No, read the question. You know, and then then it'll, it'll be better. I, I think it's really important to be very careful reading the question. OK, next I talk about creatine kinase. Creatine kinase was an interesting thing. Now, I don't have the slide to show you, but I'll just tell you the equation. Creatine plus ATP goes to creatine phosphate plus ADP. That equation, okay, if we look at that reaction, the delta G zero prime for that reaction is plus 12 kilojoules per mole, meaning if we start with equal concentrations of products and reactants, the re direction that reaction is going to go is to the left. It's not going to make creatine phosphate. How do we make creatine phosphate? We make creatine phosphate okay, by having the ATP concentration being high on the left and the ADP concentration being low on the right. right. In other words, we're making more products and fewer reactants. That drives the delta G, which is the ter determinant of the direction, to the right. That's what's happening in that creatine kinase reaction. So when do I have high concentrations of ATP? I have high concentrations of ATP when I'm, s you, when I'm sitting here like you guys are. right? Eating pizza, drinking beer, and watching the tube, right? 
That's where my ATP concentrations are high because I'm not exercising. Maybe my brain is working a little bit, but if I'm watching the tube, it's probably not very high at all, right? But my ATP concentrations are high because I'm not using my brain. Everybody with me? OK, so that's how I make creatine phosphate. So when I'm sitting around doing nothing, my creatine phosphate concentrations are high. When the fire alarm goes off and I hear, oh my god, there's a fire, I've got to get out of this place, or my roommate comes home and I decide, whoa, I'm getting out of here, right? Either way, don't tell Indira, I said, I'll be in trouble, guys, OK? All right, or your roommate gets home, all right? You get up and you get out of there. First thing that happens is you start burning ATP because that's what your muscles do to contract. That's what they require. Your ATP concentrations fall immediately. Well, if you don't make up that difference immediately, you're going to stop. You're going to get about 10 steps, and you're going to stop because you're not going to have any ATP left. So you need an immediate source of ATP. You don't need hormones. You don't need to wait on hormones, which might take a minute to get the process started. You need ATP right now. This creatine phosphate equation does that for you because as you start using ATP, you start losing product. And when you start losing product, which direction does the reaction go? Back to the left. And back to the left, what is produced? ATP. Okay? And that happens instantaneously. So creatine phosphate is your backup source of ATP in your muscles. Really, really important. Then when you're done with that exercise, ATP concentrations start rising. And the reaction moves back to the right and starts making creatine phosphate. Am I clear? OK. That's what's happening with creatine phosphate. <coughs> ATP and potential energy. The only point there was to show you the structure of ATP and point out how energy was stored in that triphosphate. Three negative charges sitting right next to each other, very unhappy with each other, but they're held together by a covalent bond between the phosphates. You break that covalent bond with hydrolysis, with water, right? And the first thing that's going to happen is that negatively charged phosphate is going to go sprawling away as far as it can. Energy is released in that process. So you have potential energy, and then you have actual energy in the release of that phosphate, all right? That's how ATP stores energy within it. Oxidation reduction. I showed that biological oxidations produce electrons. And when they produce electrons, those electrons are stored in electron carriers. The one in class that I showed you was NAD, which gains electrons to become NADH. Conversely, NADH can give up electrons to something else and become NAD. And we'll see examples of both. Okay. Um, energy coupling. Energy coupling is very important when we think about how is it that an energetically unfavorable reaction is made favorable. Keep in mind, folks, that cells have to work within the boundaries of energy of the universe. Cells are not different than everything else out there. They have to work within the laws of physics, within the laws of chemistry, just as this computer does, just as this uh, podium does. All right? So if we have an energetically fa unfavorable reaction and the cell needs to have that reaction going forward, it has to have a way to make that happen. And cells have evolved this way of coupling energetically favorable processes with energetically unfavorable processes to make something happen. Okay? It's kind of like, I guess, when, I'm trying to think of a good, a good analogy here, but maybe this isn't a perfect analogy, but maybe when you're a kid and you get a bad report card, which I know none of you ever did, but you go home and you've got a bad report card, and what are you going to tell your parents, right? Well, if you walk up and you say, here's my bad report card, what's going to happen, right? Well, this isn't good. So you start thinking, oh, maybe, well, I can help run the house, <laughs> right? I can be really nice tonight. Santa Claus is coming to town sort of thing. I can really be good because maybe that's going to have, help get over this hump that I have of my parents' attitude. 
my parents' attitude is that energetically unfavorable reaction. So I'm coupling good behavior with a bad response to get hopefully a mediocre. That's what's happening with energy coupling. Energetically unfavorable process with an energetically favorable process to make the whole thing go forwards. All right. OK. Um, yeah, yeah. A molecule that would do this? Well, I gave an example in class where I, I pointed out that if you take glucose and you try to put a phosphate onto it, that that process has a delta G uh, of about plus 14 kilojoules per mole. It's energetically unfavorable if you start with equal concentrations of glucose 6-phosphate, which is the product, and the two reactants, which are glucose and phosphate. The same reaction, however, has a delta G 0 prime of minus 16 and a half if you make, instead of using phosphate, you use ATP. That's the hexokinase reaction. So if you use ATP, you now get glucose plus ATP goes to glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. You're coupling the hydrolysis of ATP with the putting of the phosphate onto glucose. So the, the hydrolysis of ATP is energetically favorable. It's contributing energy to making the glucose 6-phosphate, whereas in the first reaction, you don't have that energy source, and it was energetically unfavorable. Does that make sense? OK. All right, a lot of talking on my part. Metabolic pathways, I pointed out, are roadmaps. Metabolic pathways, A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, goes to E. Just like going from Corvallis involves going to Albany, going to Salem, going to Woodburn, going to Wilsonville, going to Portland, right? Same sort of analogy. Um, I can go to Portland in many ways. I can go from glucose to um, aspartic acid in many ways. Okay. And so, but I do have to follow the roads. I can't do an off-road vehicle with uh, metabolic pathways. Off-road vehicles don't usually end up with good results with metabolic pathways because they would involve non-enzymatic processes, and whenever cells do non-enzymatic reactions, they almost always have problems. So cells are going to follow metabolic pathways because those are governed by enzymes. OK. Um, I show the interconnectedness of uh, the uh, various compounds. The example I gave in class was glucose 6-phosphate, which I showed was connected to glycogen metabolism. It was connected to the pentose phosphate pathway. It was connected to glycolysis. It was connected to gluconeogenesis. And it was connected to the citric acid cycle. It had essentially direct connections to all five of those pathways. Just like the road system is connected all over, I could say, well, this road that goes to Corvallis also goes to Seattle. And it also goes all the way the hell over to New York. I can take that road if I go on the right pathway to get over there. Similarly pathways that I have with molecules can go to very distant things and end up with uh, a completely different molecule. Um, I pointed out that gly uh, glycolysis was a central metabolic pathway, meaning it was central to things that were happening in essentially every cell. And that some of those intermediates of glycolysis are important in other pathways, glucose 6-phosphate being one of several examples. I didn't specifically talk about oxygen and fermentation, uh, but suffice it to say, I'll just briefly say that we will talk about that as we talk about glycolysis. And um, uh, that I'll save that actually for the glycolysis lecture down here. The last thing had to do with high energy intermediates and energy barriers. I didn't really say a lot about the barriers part of it, uh, so I'm not going to say too much here. To, uh, we, we will talk about that when we talk about the aldolase reaction uh, in class. But suffice it to say that Production of high energy molecules is a challenge for cells. Okay? ATP is a high energy molecule. And I pointed out molecules that had energy levels even higher than ATP. And to produce those, cells have to go through some extensive oxidation reactions in order to make them, because that's what it takes is the high energy necessary to create those molecules. And I'll talk more about those with Clay. That led me to the point of glycolysis, which is where I started the material for the final exam, and so I'm not going to go through that at this time. 
I did mention, I think, at the very end of the overview lecture that somebody asked, is it, you know, will I be doing these lectures regularly? And I will do a weekly lecture in the evenings uh, to sort of review things with you that I've done. I'll schedule one, not this week. Obviously, tonight is the only time I can meet this week. But I will schedule uh, one for next week, uh, and I'll videotape those as well, because I want you guys to have a, a good overview of what's happening here. I want you guys to be my best class. Right? It's my book. Right? So I'm using my book for the first time. I want you to be the best damn class. So I got a vested interest in that. Yeah. I have no idea yet. No. It depends on my schedule, because my schedule varies from week to week a lot. Yes. And you don't need to leave. You're welcome to stay and ask questions if you want. You're welcome to leave if you need to, too. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I will do one during dead week as well. So I'll have one next week, and I'll have one during dead week. And what, what is the day of our exam, final exam? Anybody remember? It's on Tuesday. What time? Tuesday at 2. So I'll do, probably do a review session, I would guess, that weekend. Uh, but I haven't thought that far ahead yet. So yeah. Yeah. What, oh, good question. What's the difference between phosphorylases and phosphatases? So a phos let's start with phosphatase first. Okay? So a phosphatase is the opposite of a kinase. So kinases put phosphates on. Phosphatases take phosphates off. So if I have uh, a tyrosine kinase, for example, it's going to put a phosphate onto tyrosine. A phosphatase is going to take phosphate off of that tyrosine. A phosphorylase we haven't really talked about, but I'll tell you the answer to your question. A phosphorylase is an enzyme that uses a phosphate to cleave something. So glycogen phosphorylase that I've talked about, you'll notice if you look at that figure that glycogen phosphorylase is producing glucose 1-phosphate. The phosphate is used to cleave the glucose off, and it becomes attached in the process. So, uh, but beta adrenergic receptor. That's right. That's where it is. Good question, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not asking you to. Mem I'm not sure what the question is. I think anything I talk about in class, as I've said, is fair game. But I'm not sure what you're asking me. So um, I think I covered that in class in terms of what depth I think that you should know stuff. So I, I don't think that's, uh, I think that's in the lectures, actually. If it's not, come see me, but, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. Yeah? Subtle license. Close, though. I knew what you meant. OK, so um, good question. Is there a difference between subtle lysin, which has a similar recognition uh, sequence from that of chymotrypsin? They both recognize large, fairly nonpolar things. Keep in mind that the function of all these is the same. The function is to cut a protein, break peptide bonds. That's true irrespective of what the specificity is. So the function in every case is the same. Chymotrypsin cuts peptide bonds. Trypsin cuts cuts peptide bonds. Elastase cuts peptide bonds. All of these are cutting peptide bonds, breaking pro proteins into smaller pieces. Now, there will be subtle differences between the specificities of these, meaning exactly where they cut. All right? So uh, yeah, there are going to be some subtle differences between subtle lysin and chymotrypsin, but it doesn't interfere with the fact that they're both proteases. OK? Yes. Sure. How does a, so the question is, how can a homotropic effector be an allosteric effector? All right. Uh, the example for that is ATCAs. And specifically, aspartate is a homotropic effector. So let's first of all talk about the definitions. 
So a homotropic effector is something that is a substrate for an enzyme that affects an enzyme's activity. That's what a homotropic effector is. A substrate for an enzyme that affects an enzyme's activity. Okay? If we're going to affect an enzyme's activity, what are we going to have to do to the enzyme? What's going to have to happen to the enzyme for us to affect the enzyme's activity? Shape change. Excellent. It's always a shape change. And specifically, the shape change is going to be to go from R to T or T to R. Now, I'll give you a little clue here. When we talk about homotropic effectors of enzymes, they will always go T to R. I didn't tell you that in class, and you don't need to know that, but it's true. It doesn't make any sense for, this, for the enzyme to have a substrate that turns itself off, the weird exception being which one? Anybody remember? Nope. I talked about it last lecture. Nobody's looked at the last lecture, which is fine. PF, PFK. PFK, you remember, had ATP that natively affects it. And how was PFK affected? Affecting the enzyme? No. So PFK was affected by ATP by having two binding sites for ATP. One that was the allosteric binding site and one that was the substrate binding site. Right? So that one isn't even a, a homotropic effector. But getting back to your question, ATCase affects the enzyme. How does it affect the enzyme? When it binds to the enzyme, it causes the enzyme to flip from the T to the R state. Now, you've seen this happen with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin was a really good example. And even though hemoglobin is not an enzyme, it's binding something just like an enzyme does. And binding of that substrate, as it were, in this case, oxygen for hemoglobin, caused the hemoglobin to change from the T to the R state. It favored the binding of additional oxygens, right? Well, the same thing is happening with ATCase when it binds to aspartate. Remember that? ATCase has six active sites and six, I'm sorry, six catalytic sites and six um, allosteric sites or regulatory sites, right? Aspartate is binding to the regular, I'm, I'm sorry, binding to the catalytic sites. I can't even say it right. Binds to the catalytic sites. Once the first one binds, the enzyme flips into the R state. And now it wants to bind more in the unbound catalytic sites. That's how a homotropic effector changes an enzyme. OK? Clear as mud. Yes? Yep. OK. Good question. Good question. So what's happening to the other subunits? The answer is nothing. Wait a minute, Ahern. You just said, all right, no, nothing is happening to the subunits. What's happening is to the enzyme as a whole. So you can imagine that the enzyme has 12 subunits, six regulatory, six catalytic. If those regulatory are partially covering up active sites, and now you change the structure of the enzyme so that they relax a little bit and the active sites become open, that's what's happening. So you're not changing the catalytic subunits. You're changing the overall structure of the enzyme so that the substrate can get to the active site. Make sense? Yep. Yep. There is an increased affinity for that when you, because now you've opened it up. If you put, you know, it's, it's like if you put, uh, uh, I don't know, your garage door partly down, you can't take as many things in as if you put the garage door completely open, right? You can put a subcompact in there, but you can't put in your um, Land Cruiser or whatever monstrosity that you want to put in there. Yes? Uh, well, I have this video posted tonight. Probably not. Probably not. I was, up, I was up here until, I think, 11 o'clock on Sunday night trying to get the uh, problem set videos done because I was having this terrible problem with the, with the camera. <laughs> and so I I've, I've try to limit how much I'm up here is, is what I try to do. Yes? What is the von Willebrandt factor? The von Willebrandt factor is a protein involved in the clotting process. I haven't said a lot about it, but it's involved in um, controlling uh, Gazunite. Gazunite again. Uh, 
um, it's involved in controlling some of the factors necessary for the clotting process. So if you lose function of the von Willebrandt factor, you, be, you become, uh, you, you exhibit a, a behavior, behavior, you exhibit a phenotype very much like a hemophiliac. Can't clot the blood. So that von Willebrandt factor plays a very important role in that clotting process. Yes? Can I do what now? Oh, feedback inhibition. OK. Um, yeah, sure. Let me see. Somebody, again, can I get a piece of paper and maybe a pen from somebody? I'll, I'll, I'll switch over to this thing and, and show you on the screen. How's that? It makes sense. Oh, thank you, Leo. Yeah. Can I borrow your pen, or is that your only pen? Yep, let's see if I can get this on. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's on. Okay, so feedback inhibition. If I've got A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D. How much space do I have? Okay, goes to E, right? Goes to a variety of things. And this goes down to, let's say, J, okay? That's a pathway. You've seen glycolysis has 10 steps, for example. That's a pathway. A, glucose goes to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. One leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. Feedback inhibition occurs when the end product, in this case, J, it could be pyruvate, for example, goes back and inhibits the first enzyme in the pathway. We'll call this ahernase. Okay? If you want to know how to inhibit ahernase, put plenty of J on it and you've knocked it out. I hope nobody has any J because I feel kind of knocked out right now. Right? So that's what feedback inhibition is. Does that answer your question? I forget who asked it. Yeah. No, no, no. You're talking, the, don't confuse the feedback inhibition with the blood clotting process. That's not feedback inhibition. Okay. Feedback inhibition occurs allosterically, meaning an end product, in this case J, is binding to an enzyme here. That's not happening in blood clotting. You're not inhibiting that process in blood clotting. Blood clotting is a series of covalent modifications, okay? Those are serine proteases that are cleaving, 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 cleaving. That's that cascade that I talked about. You're activating. You're not in inactivating anything there. So don't confuse those two. That's, that's not going on in blood clotting. No. Yes? Yes. What's allosteric, right? OK. What's allosteric? Here's allosteric. I've got. Um, I waste a lot of paper here. I've got ahernase. Ahernase is able to bind to J. And when ahernase binds to J, it is, has a shape change so that it, its active site is no longer open. Can't do anything, right? That is an allosteric thing. Allosteric will, things will always involve, and look at the definition I gave you for that, binding of a small molecule that affects the activity of an enzyme. So that's what I've drawn on the screen. That's what an allosteric enzyme is. That's different from a zymogen. If you look at the problem set that I did, I, I made this distinction between allosteric inhibition, which is turning, turning up or down the volume, and activation and inactivation that happens with zymogens. Zymogens are made in an inactive form. You cleave a peptide bond to open up access to the active site, and now it's completely active. So you, you have an on-off switch with zymogens. You don't have that with allosteric things. OK? Yes, ma'am? Uh, so yeah, good question. So once you've activated a zymogen, will it ever go back to being inactive? 
Generally, you won't do additional cleavages to make it inactive, no. But I have talked about something in class that will make an activated zymogen inactive. Does anybody remember what it is? What's that? No. What's that? Serpents, yeah. Serpents, you have, you have those protease inhibitors. They bind and cover up the active site. Okay. They bind and cover up the active site. The reason that that's not the case for competitive inhibition is we're generally talking about an, uh, an externally made molecule when we're doing competitive inhibition. So that's a, a man-made molecule that's doing that. So that's not a biological control mechanism for the most part. So if I add pala, which is one thing I talked about in class, that's a man-made molecule, for example. Okay, yep. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. So once you've activated a zymogen, it's going to be, it's going to be active until the cellular machinery either breaks it down. So I talked about how ubiquitin can target enzymes for destruction. Right? That's one way. Another way is via the uh, uh, inhibitors, protease inhibitors or other types of inhibitors that can bind to it. That's the two mechanisms for inactivating an enzyme once it has become activated, okay, or a zymogen once it has become activated. Okay? But cells do, and this, it's, it's a good thing to think about, cells do have to control enzymes. Once you've made an enzyme, you don't necessarily want it to be there forever. And that's why this breakdown process with ubiquitin, for example, is very important. So cells have, uh, I'm sorry, proteins have what we call a half-life associated with them. There are some proteins we want to be there as long as we can have them there, and there are other proteins we want to have there for a short period of time. We don't want them to be out there for another long period of time. When we look at the um, um, glycogen metabolism, you're going to see that putting phosphates onto glycogen phosphorylase has a dramatic effect in activating it. And taking them off has an equally dramatic effect in inactivating them. So covalent modifications like that are other ways of controlling enzymes. Okay. Okay, yes. Okay, I think I did that in the overview. Have you seen the overview? Okay, look at the overview from last time. because I, I, I went through that, and I don't want to go through that again here. And the reason for that, I'm, I'm, I'll talk to you separately if you'd like. I don't want to do that here because I think to students the message is, oh, my God, there's all this complexity, and now he's going to talk about more about it again and so forth. And I would rather refer you to that overview, but I'd also be happy to just talk with you separately rather than try to get people too worried about that amplification. Okay? Yeah. Kate? Oh, okay. Can I talk about the cyclization of straight carbohydrates into ring structures? So let's, let's do a simple one. Here's glucose. Or actually, I'll draw it like this. Okay. There's glucose, right? And there's glucose in the ring structure. Now, what's happening is the, um, the carbonyl carbon, okay, is being basically attacked by the hydroxyl of this carbon. So we have carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, three, four, five, six, and we have one. There's that oxygen. There's that oxygen right there. Two, three, four, five, six. Now, you can try to memorize rules if you want of which is down and which is right, but they only apply to carbons two, three, four, right? because alpha carbon number one doesn't play a role in that process. Uh, carbon number five has its hydroxyl now that's been gone to the right, and the carbon number six is up when you have a D sugar. So I think that by the time you memorize all the rules, you memorize more rules than if you just memorize the structure to begin with. 
So I always think of, of glucose as right, left, right, right. That's what the linear structure is, right, left, right, right. If you look at glucose in the ring structure, it's down, down, up, down, up, if you have the alpha form. And so from that, I can figure out every other sugar, and I can figure out every other thing that's here. So I don't memorize that rule. I, I, people, I mean, you can do it, but I just find that there's, there's more rules than there is just knowing the structure. Right, left, right, right, down, down, up, down, up. Make sense? Is that a question? Oh, I have read your mind. The Amazing Kreskin. I'm, too, I'm old enough, nobody knows the Amazing Kreskin is except me. <clears throat> Clear as mud? You guys feeling good? Confident? No? Too little material? <laughs> the look on your face. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. I shouldn't joke about such things, right? It's like joking about a train wreck or something. It's what's wrong with you? You're sick, eh, Hern? Um, all right. So. I know my schedule is very busy, but I will always make time for you. So if you have questions, come see me. I will speed up what I'm doing, and I will make time for you. So please come, uh, please come if you have questions, OK? Study hard. I will get the video posted as quickly as I can.